work reflects his natural acumen for bringing visions to life with minimal direction. His most recent projects include Savage Salvation, The Voice Season 22, Maddie Rich's Birth of the Black Underworld, HBO's We Own This City, and Netflix's First Kill, to name, to, just to name a few. He also works closely with SMP Rise, which is a nonprofit organization where he mentors aspiring production designers from underrepresented populations on their journey to a career in the art department. Please welcome Lamo Hex.
really, I think um, on social media, I kind of brand myself as a lesbian. I have a TikTok page and I'm like, I'm a lesbian, so I'm gonna let y'all know that right now. Um, but I think also as femme presenting, sometimes they don't know that. And um, I like to represent and be like, yes, I am a lesbian and that's who I am. Because most times they don't, they don't think I am. They think I'm straight. <laughs> so interesting. I'm gonna share with some I like to share. I Googled myself not that long ago, and you know what I found out people are looking up about me? Who is my husband? It literally, I, it was like that was one of the biggest searches. Who is Jasmine Canick's husband? Well, tell me. Because I damn sure don't know. I don't even have a girlfriend, so if I got a husband, let me know. So I find that really interesting because when you are been presenting, right? Um, yeah, people you know, I guess they don't know unless you yeah. divulge that information, right? Yeah. yeah. Ready, Jazzy? I'm ready. Okay. Do I need to repeat it or you already know it? Uh, well. Did you ever hide your sexual identity or sexual orientation in order to break into the field in Hollywood that you wanted to work in? No, I've been going to performing arts high schools and middle schools and colleges since I was a kid, so everyone around me was always queer. My friends were queer, my educators were queer. Like, we never had to hide who we were. And then, you know, eventually later on in life, I was living out in the Bay Area, so I just did not believe straight people exist. So I just, you know, lived my life as myself. I never went on set and had to be like, hey, I'm Jazzy, by the way, I'm gay. It never had to happen that way. It was like, hey, I'm Jazzy, what are we doing today? And that's just kind of how I go into every day at work. Follow ups. What generation are you? I am a millennial. Great, so you can thank our generation for you being able to go to work and be out and be all that you can be. I think every generation. <laughs> I think the younger generations for the things that they're doing. I think my generation for the things that we were doing. I think everyone's generation. I mean, I think it's so cool when you can look back at pictures of just the underground queer clubs in Harlem or in Chicago, and they're just beautiful black and white photos and all of these people then paved the way for all of us. And they were doing it at a time where it was highly dangerous for them to express themselves and who they were, but they still weren't scared. And so I think that for all of us, you know, we still go out there and we live our best lives as best we can. So you definitely would agree that it is important, no matter what generation you're in, to make sure that you're doing something in your life for the generations to come, right? That makes it better for them, right? That maybe your work makes it better for someone who's a Gen Zer, right? I believe that about everything that I do. Being, you know, a black femme, being a queer person, being being in Hollywood in general, being, you know, just a woman in a male dominated space. I feel like everything that I do is for the people that are come that are gonna come after me. And, you know, I know that I'm doing a great job because I'm obviously sitting here with these lovely people. And I feel like, you know, I always want to say that years and years and years from now, I'm going to be at the top of someone's family tree. And they're going to be like, this was my great, great grandma Jazzy. And she was just the craziest person. She always went after her dreams. She fought every adversity. And like, I'm here in this great position now because of her. And it's like, yeah, it'll be someone I'll never meet. But it's just, those are the kinds of goals that I have for myself. That's me. All right. All right. Uh, um, can y'all hear me? All day. All day. All day. Um, uh, it was different for me. I was afraid to come out because I'm the oldest of seven, and I have my daddy's name. So like, I was always structured to like being in the closet. Like, I had girlfriends and everything. I was like, what? Anyway, but it wasn't until like maybe 16 or 17 when I came out the closet that I finally started to embrace myself, but that fear kept me inside. So going into like everything I was doing, I never really talked about my sexuality. Um, I pretended to be macho, you know, cause I was still trying to figure out what feminine was at 17. I and mean, we're talking about the 1997s around there, you know, I'm just trying to figure out like, who am I? Um, I decided not to do that and put my focus into everyone else. So like I was a people pleaser, so that the attention would be away from me. Um, 
so breaking into the industry, it wasn't a sense of like, oh yeah, I'm gonna tell everyone I'm gay, because I'm like, what about if they don't accept me? What about if I don't get that job? And I was like, yeah, I don't wanna do that because I already came out to my parents, right? They're looking at me like, okay, can you get a job? Like, are you, you know, it was just so much going on. So it wasn't until, to be transparent, it wasn't until a couple of years ago where I started to just be comfortable um, in my skin. Um, but now I feel like my sexuality does not define me as a business person. So you don't need to know who I sleep with. What you need to do is cut that check. That's right. Run me my money. And that's it. You know? So, yeah. Now I'm okay with it. I don't care. You be like, hey, you like guys? I'm like, hell to the yes, please. Okay? <laughs> so my follow-up for you would be, do you feel like since, you know, you um, moved into this position in your life that you ever maybe lost out on work or because someone suspected or thought something or well I feel like I'm for me personally I've lost out on work a lot because of my background so I'm Puerto Rican Italian Palestinian and I'm a redhead so the reality is I tend to not tell people my last name because I've, I've gotten no jobs because of my last name or people assume that I'm white because I'm light-skinned. And, you know, there's this whole perception of my identity. I'm like, just, you can't tell me who I am, you know. It, it, again, it doesn't define the work that I can do. Um, so I did lose out on all, a lot of opportunity. But I position myself to be in rooms like this and meet people like this and be confident enough to be like, I'm queer, and I love that about me. Like, it doesn't define me as a man. It's just... I like guys, okay, and moving on, you know? So um, now, no, I don't have no missed opportunities because I don't play those games. <laughs> so I was sitting here, and the journalist of me just thought of a whole other question that I didn't even put down. So we gonna rock, we gonna, you said earlier we were just gonna roll with it. Um, in my life, I am often asked who I am. And, and when you said, you know, no, no one can define me, so when I'm asked, I always say that I'm a black woman who's lesbian. Why am I mentioning that? Because a lot of times when you read stories in the paper, or you see things on television, they always start off with um, gay black person. And I have to remind people that you are black before you are anything else. When you get pulled over, the LAPD don't know who you like and who you sleeping with. They see the color of your skin, right? So I was just wondering for each of you, and we're gonna start with you, we're gonna go this way. Um, how do you, if you were asked that question, like, you know, what is the order of sequence for you? What are, you know, are you a, you know, I know that you said that you were a Puerto Rican, Palestinian, Italian. and Italian. That's a lot. I know. <laughs> Wait, and then you said you were a redhead on top of all of this. So like, how do you identify? Um. It's, that's, a, that's a really great question. I'm, honestly, when people ask me who I am, I literally just tell them God, because that's how I walk. I walk in love. I don't, it, my character, my name even doesn't define who I am. You know, I'm, I'm at the point where I'm just stripped. You know, so when you meet me, you're going to meet my energy. You're going to meet my spirit. You're going to meet my soul. Um, and that's how I've been connecting with people. Uh, but if I had to put it on a paper, I'm a gay male. Like, that's it, you know. Um, I'm always marking mixed, you know. Hispanic mix because they don't have boxes for Palestinians or Italian people, you know, as far as like cultural stuff on there. But that's, I say my last name now. Like it doesn't, I've become so much stronger in who I am as a, as a man that I'm like, if you don't want me, that's just God saying that ain't for you. Moving on. That's how I am now.
Sandra. Um, I define myself as black, uh, queer, femme, creative. Um, because one, creativity for me is like number one. Um, if I'm not able to be creative, I don't, <laughs> I don't think I'll be able to like live, honestly. Creativity just runs through my, my blood, my, my everything. Um, so, but I love what you said, like, I identify as black first, though, always, no matter what. When I walk in the room, I am black. I am black. Um, and then queer comes after that, um, but I'm black first. I'm a black woman, and a lot of times I am the only black woman in the room. So I want to make sure that they know that. I'm black, and I'm creative too, but I'm black. Yes. yes. <laughs> Mama.
it was great storytelling. So I think Orange is the New Black is where I was like, okay, we're finally getting in there. We're, sh we're sharing our stories. We're being able to like tell them um, and showcase that. Awesome. You know, Lavo, I, st I was thinking while Shatandra was speaking, what about, because you know, Ellen wasn't the greatest, but I do remember when Ellen did her whole thing, right? But what about the color purple? What about the scene in the color purple? Yeah? Or Brewster Space. Yeah. Sorry, they wanted you to speak up. I forgot someone texted me that. Do so I need to speak louder? Yeah, I or think closer? so. Or both? Maybe both. Let's Maybe try I'll both. Just, all right, I'll scream. Okay. So I remember that I uh, watched Tu Wong Fu a lot when I was a kid, and I also watched The Birdcage a yes. lot when I was a kid, yes. too. Yes. And both of those movies were just hilarious, and I, just, I always just felt connected to the characters. I just knew that somehow these were my people. And I remember RuPaul had a TV show when I was a kid, too, and I would watch it with my mom. And that was, honestly, in my eyes, I was like, it's a black woman with blonde hair. I didn't know we could have blonde hair. And my mom was like, baby, that's, that's not, that's a man. And I'm like, no, mom, it's a woman. <laughs> this, is, this is a woman with blonde hair, and she's black, which means I could have blonde hair, too, when I get older. And... I, I always said, you know, just my biggest style and inspirations when I was a kid was RuPaul and Lil' Kim because I could just have any hair color I wanted. I could dress how I wanted. I didn't have to look like every other black woman that I saw on TV. And so that was, like, a really big part of my childhood. So, yeah, RuPaul, like, RuPaul has done everything <laughs> for the longest for our entire community yeah. Yeah. and still does. I mean... Birdcage, definitely. Tu Wong Fu, definitely. Um, of course, RuPaul, but honestly, yeah, it, a cultural shift for me was Noah's Ark. Yeah, I identified with them because I'm from New York, and, you know, for me as a queer male, like, no shade, my attraction is to culture, you know, like, if you don't know what food is, if you don't know what culture is, if you don't know what style is, like, we have nothing in common. So, like, watching that as a young queer person growing up, because I also know Patrick, he's a really good friend of mine. So, watching that, um, it just gave me diversity. It gave me so many different aspects, feminine, masculine, you know, you, you can do both, versatility, top, bottom. It was like, I learned so much from that show, and it really cultivated me as a man. Outside of, of course, watching The Birdcage, Robin Williams, I mean, genius, I love that man. Uh, RuPaul, of course, trendsetter to essentially open up the drag world to the world, um, but it wasn't until Noah's Ark came on, and I would watch it every day, and, well, we would watch Rio's, and every Thursday we would come, I'd go to my friend's house, and it would, like, we would literally be like, okay, don't, nobody talk, let's go. Um, and we were sad that they, got the boots, but, um, you know, for me, I, I stayed connected to that. I still watch it to this day. It's an amazing, amazing story. If y'all don't know what it is, check it out. Um, it, it identifies not only queer community, but also, like, heteronorms and, like, family, like, the dynamics of, like, coming out the closet, getting married. I was like, yes, yes, and yes. I literally sat my, my parents on. I'm like, y'all need to watch this. This is me. And they did, and it was great. So the next question I have, so it's 2023, a lot has changed, um, particularly um, in film and television, and, and in some ways, things haven't changed. So in what ways do you feel that Hollywood um, is getting better um, at queer um, inclusion, and in what ways is it still not? We'll start with you, Anthony. I feel like Hollywood is becoming more open to queer people, especially black queer people in the community. And, and they're making it more visible um, because people are standing up. We're speaking our voices. We're, being, we're basically saying, I'm not doing this for you. It's for me. And if you're not a part of it, then, you know, we're not going to do it. Um, I think that change also is with us. Like, we also have to be a part of that change. Like, if you don't speak up, if you don't 
basically set your boundaries, get your respect, you know, as a person of color, as a, just a human, a female, a male, and also like queer, then you're always going to be disrespected. You know, once you start setting that tone, everyone around you is going to respect you. And then I know now, like just watching, I, we had the other panel and I was just like, all these beautiful black women are like the stars of these big shows. And it just, to me, it's like, I can't wait to see a panel of queer men and women, trans men, trans women, all sitting down at the top of like these shows or even like just cultivating just culture to a point where it's like, it's, it's, it's normal. Like we're here, we're not going anywhere. Um, and, and again, I'm a part of that, that change. So yeah. My follow-up to you to that, um, to something you said, um, would be this. Do you think that what we're, any of what we're seeing in Hollywood is performative when it comes to black Ooh, queer folks? Did y'all pay the light bill? What's going on? <laughs> um, what was your question again? That threw you off. It did. I was like, <laughs> okay. So my question is, do you think any of what we're seeing when it comes to black queer inclusion or representation of Hollywood is just performative. It's just like, okay, this is what we need to do in this moment right now to escape the wrath of social media, to look like we're, you know, we're I would, being I would say, I would say no. I feel like, I would say yes or no. Yes, we're having these conversations and things are changing, but I feel like no, and this is not shady, but the gay people that I see on TV, male-wise, are overly flamboyant. Flamboyant. They're, they're, you know, basically just not the person that I am. So I feel like they're showcasing. And this goes to also stereotyping. Like black queer, you know, women on TV have to look a certain way. Like even in the black community culture. Like if we continue to have those conversations, we continue to push them and say no. At the end of the day, it will change. Um, but again, it has to start with, with us, you know? We have to make our voices heard in order for them to see us. And when they see us, not have them change who we are and make sure that they're sticking to what we want so that we can put on a great performance for people to be like, oh, that's me on TV. I, oh my God, I identify with that person right there. Not just, there's another feminine guy on TV cutting up, great. Okay, there's another woman who has a bob on TV, or oh, she has an afro because she's black. Like, not everyone has that. Like, I want to see everything, and I think that we're starting to get to that point. It'll be more defined as we continue to grow, for sure. Before I get to you, I thought another one, Lamo. <laughs> Cleo from Set It Off. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Jazzy. <laughs> okay, so. My sister looks a lot like Queen Latifah, so Set It Off was such a traumatizing movie for me when I was a little girl. I cried so hard at the end of that movie, and I never watched it again. Oh, wow. It was so, it was, they did them wrong in that movie. They did them wrong. They just needed the, she needed the money. Like, they all needed that money. Um, I got thrown off. Anyway, so, I, uh, I do think that there's some really and inclusive narratives that are queer on TV. I think Pose was brilliant and amazing. And I mean, everyone acted down on Pose and I didn't feel like it was stereotypical in any way. I felt like it was honest and we're really getting to learn the lives of these characters. And, you know, I have a lot of friends that felt like the representation that they saw being trans women was always in a sexual light. You know, it was never in a light of, this is my day to day. And I felt like Pose was one of those shows that did show, this is what my day to day is. And that, you know, that was a really true narrative. I think that we still have a long way. I think that it is half genuine and half performative. Um, a lot of times when people say diversity and inclusion, they don't really mean it. They just say it to not sound like a bigot. And a lot of times, like, you know, when you're the diversity hire. So, it's, it's not fully genuine, but it's also not fully performative, and I'm hopeful. You know, there's a lot of great people out there that are starting to change that, and that's just all we have to do. We just have to keep showing up. We have to keep pushing the boundaries. We have to keep trying to see more of us on television. Thank you. Shatantra. 
Yeah, so um, I work on the unscripted reality TV side, and um, I've had the opportunity to work on queer shows. I worked on a show called Queer Eye, and um, it is a great show on Netflix that um, five gay men come in and make over people's lives. Um, and I was able to help um, create stories for not only straight people on that show, but queer stories of change and, and makeover. So um, I love that that show was able to like put that out on the platform. But there's also other reality shows like Legendary. Um, Legendary is a great, great, great show. Um, I actually have a friend who worked on the show. Um, but they were able to sh show that ballroom, you know, underground, nightlife, you know, like, and tell those stories because we have not seen that. And so the fact that they were able to get a platform and, um, of course, Pose was part of that, but, like, Legendary was, like, it's real. Like, those are real houses. Those are real people. Um, and I, I love, 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 love that show. Um, but I do feel like, the, you know, there could be more. There can be more. Um, I do watch a show called The L Word, um, which I love that, you know, we're able to put lesbians out and tell the stories, but I wish there was more. I feel like there are no people of color, lesbians on that show. Um, and we have a different story to tell. We have, there are different type of lesbians. There's the stud masculine, there are, you know, femmes, there's the, you know, you know, we, we all over the place, right. but you know, we don't, we don't see that. And, um, I, I wish that we could push more to tell those stories. Um, and I know a lot of my friends, they're like, you know, we watched the, we watched the L word together and they're like, well, I don't see me on there. So like, I'm not watching this. And so it's kind of like, okay, what do I need to do to make sure that we see ourselves in this? So I, I try to make sure I push that out there. Um, but, um, I think we are, we are getting there. We really are. We have a lot of stuff that's out there that's able to tell our story and it's beautiful. So follow up. Yes. You must be watching the reboot. I am. Okay. okay. But I will say in fairness, we said the same thing about the original. Well, okay. Wow. Well, just keeping it real. Um, so law and order, uh, organized crime, Nice black lesbian couple on there. Nice black lesbian lead. Um, God, the mur the mystery show, mur uh, murder building. Uh, only murders in the built in in the building, right? Nice again, uh, police officer, black woman, lesbian. So I've been noticing too some black lesbian couples, and I'm a, no sh no definitely shade. I was very pleased that they were also with black women whole nother conversation, but every time I see a lot of black queer characters, they are not with other black people, which is a whole nother conversation we need to have. But yeah, I thought I would, yeah. We, we getting there, I, I've seen a we couple of us. We getting there. Blamo. So um, the show that I'm used to is Tom, um, that I liked was Tom Swift. It was just one season and it was gone. And that, for me, like I never really liked the futuristic um, characteristics of that show. But um, this, you know, not that, that show. I didn't like shows like that. Marvel, no. But um, that show, it got me into that. And I'm like, okay, this is a character that is a black queer man. And he has, you know, intelligence, all of these things. And then it's snatched off the television. So we definitely need more shows. And also behind the scene, you know, behind the camera, there needs to be diversity other than like, oh, let's just retreat to hair and makeup. We can put some black people there and PAs and assistants. You know, let's get department heads and things of that nature behind the camera. So that, I think, we're a lot further. We have a longer way to, to go than what 
we see on camera. Since you all work in the industry, I thought we could ponder the question about why are there more queer characters in television than there are in film? Have you ever thought about that? Think about that for a minute. Let's all think about that, audience. Why are there more queer characters in television than there are in film? And when you think about it, you'll see where I'm coming, getting to, because that is the case. You will see shows like on, you know, Netflix and Hulu and um, other streaming shows, but when you think about the films that are being released in theaters and and feature league films, we don't really see pretend. We really don't see black queer. Right. I mean, I think uh, this. What was the last movie that just came out? That was, um, you know, the, I guess the two guys. They were white. I don't know. It came out during the holidays. Uncoupled. Huh? No, Bro, bros? No, Bro, the bros. one. No, the one where it was like some romantic comedy show. Huh? No, that's not it. But, but. No, I guarantee you that's not it. It was called something else. It was a family show. I remember it was like, you know, it was a movie and it was a family and I think it was during the holidays or something. Huh? No, he was about to die or something and he wanted to go that one where the guy was oh, dying. Yes. yes, see? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> it's all something, but yes, the one where the guy is Yes. If I had my phone, I would Google it, but my phone's in my purse. But yes, that that film was the last one that I could think of. Yeah. But yeah, so I just wondered what your thoughts were about, or if you've ever thought about why are there more in television, more, there's more representation, right, than in film, and what may be the reason for that? I try to come up with the hard question. Um, well, I, well, honestly, no one could really know the answer outside of the people who are fronting the money to do these movies, no shade. But the reality is I think that TV is so much more accessible to people because people are always home. You know, streaming platforms have become like this new iPhone technology kind of thing. So it's like, it's so easy. It's so it's so easy uh, for people to watch TV, put out the shows because they have another show coming out, right? And people forget like this. Movies for me, I I think the last movie I seen outside of that one, um, it was the two DL black guys. What was that movie? Yes, that to me, I was like, I want to see more of this because. I, I, I was on a down low. Like, I've been through that. So I, I relate to that. The romantic side was a movie we saw. I'm like, yes, romance. So I think movies, it needs to be more visible because it's a wider audience. But I feel like they're scared to push that. So they're doing it through television because it's easier to push out shows and shows and shows because you're going to forget the queer people uh, that are a part of those, those shows. That's my opinion. Just...
just behind the scenes. Um, a lot of people don't look like us behind the scenes, and a lot of them make the um, they make the rules. They they decide what to do and what not to do. Um, they decide if they want to market it. They decide if um, it should be a movie or not. And most times they decide, no, nah, this is not it's not film worthy because they don't see themselves and they can't relate. So um, I feel like it's we're more on TV because again it is accessible. Um, and film is just like if Middle America doesn't like it, then it's not gonna work. And that's really unfair. Lamal. Well, they pretty much answered it. Echo everything that was said. Um, the last film that I watched was um, a film called Call Me By Your Name, I believe. Or Call Me By, yeah, I think it's Call Me By Your Name. And that was, it was a messed up situation, you know, because it's this person that's comfortable with his sexuality and he falls for it, someone that has a whole wife and somewhere else. You know, so that was the last film. They did not look like me, of course. They were in Italy somewhere, but it still was like, it was a good film, you know? But hopefully we should see more diversity in that. So I will say that um, one of the things that um, I, I, also, I also work with the Pan African Film and Arts Festival, and I've been with the festival for 20 years, and one of the things that I um, started um, was making sure that we had black queer films in the festival, and we did like programming and um, this year, um, they have programmed a, a lot of black queer um, films. And some of them come from Jamaica. Some of them come from Nigeria. Um, some of them are American. And so you should definitely take some time uh, to look at your books and maybe go check some of those films out. Okay? So now we get messy. Okay? We're going to get to the messy question. Yes, because we're queer. We know how to act. It's not something that we have to portray. It's just being ourselves. And don't get me wrong, there's great straight actors who play great LGBTQ roles, but sometimes I'm like, I really can't take you seriously because you're not, like, have you ever slept with a man? Have you ever laid down? Do you know what it is to touch a man's hand? Like, for me, you know how actors really get into diving into the character. So if you're playing a queer, are you diving into that character? Are you going on dates? What kind of research you doing? I'm just saying, like, are you, uh, for me personally, like, are you going on dates? Have you kissed a person? Are you, like, you have to gain that experience to understand spiritually what a queer person is. Acting is great, but what you're telling me is that this straight actor was better than someone who's actually queer, that you could essentially boost their career, make them bigger than what they are to be more of an inspiration to people who are a part of that community than someone who is not. So now you're getting paid for one, being LGBTQ, and you're also straight. So you're doing the press for all this when this person who auditioned, who was queer, could have been that person that you could have catapulted and brought more money into your film. Because I feel like they feel like queer people don't support each other. And no shade, sometimes we don't. But I feel like when it comes to like movies, like for me, I love seeing my people on TV. I'd be like, yes, oh my God. I'd be throwing like popcorn, like no, stop. I'd be crying. But I feel like the reality is no, they should not be playing parts that are specifically catered to people who are visibly queer. So that's just me. Couple follow ups. One, I was very pissed off that they put Renee Zellweger in a fat suit to play, um, what's her name, the murderer. I was like, just find a fat woman who's an actress. Call me, I'll do it. Like, you know, yeah, so I understand what you're saying, right? But then the other part of me remembers Tom Hanks in Philadelphia. I remember you know, some actors that have taken on these roles and actually done a really good job. And, and I remember Tom Hanks in Philadelphia because that was such a moving, like, right? And then I think, you know, yeah. So I hear what you're saying. And then it, I, we, don't we also think about the trans community, right? Should, now, I get personally insulted 
when someone who is not trans, if that's an actor, plays someone who is trans, when you could just hire a trans actor. Thoughts, Jassy? I completely agree. I think it's ridiculous because even now you have, you know, trans women that are also actresses. That aren't playing cis women. So it's it's like, okay, so you have what was his name, Eddie Redmayne, who played a trans woman when you could have just hired a trans woman and then he got all these accolades and they want to label it as when an actor does something, oh, they're so brave. Are you no, the actual trans woman walking down the street in broad daylight is brave. Eddie Redmayne is not brave. So I absolutely think that um, we need to gatekeep. And I think that we have to have more people pushing back on things like that. You know, some, someone will be like, oh, it's a little controversial. No, it's disrespectful. That's what it is. So uh, absolutely, I, I think that, you know, straight people need to stay in their lane. So. <laughs> you know, it, it kind of is, it is as disrespectful as it was putting, you know, white people in blackface. It is. Right? It absolutely is, because that's exactly what they're doing. And I just don't think that you can have this actor who has all these accolades, who's a straight male, and, you know, he could go home at night and wash that character off of him. You know, and it's, it, this is a real person, you know, you're representing. And so it should be represented by that real person. You know what other character I think about, and I'm not going to remember the name of the character, but it was from the... Um, Dallas, um, Dallas Buyers Club. Yes. Yeah. Uh, she, was that Jared? Jared Leto. Yeah. And I think he won an award for it. I think he did too. I think he and, got an Oscar for that, or he was at least nominated. Yeah. Right. And so you have this man that you know everyone has said, you know, he's brave, and I can't believe he did this. But at any point in any of his acceptance speeches, were he thinking any trans women? Did he mention any trans women? Did he say anything about trans advocacy or causes or anything? Or did he just say thank you for this award and then move on with his life? Which is why it's so important that we support Laverne Cox and some of our, that's, yes, MJ Rodriguez and some of the other, yes, exactly. Well, I love you so much, Ellen Yes. Well, that's exactly what I was going to say. Just, I think it was the it was the Academy Awards and Oscars when um, they gave MJ Michaela Golden Globes. They gave her her flowers. Everybody stood up and applauded for her because yes, she needed that. She needed her flowers. They didn't give it to her the first time. Um, and so it's time to give our trans, our queer actors and actresses their flowers because they are really stepping in. And Acting up in these roles, okay? MJ, she is she is doing her thing. Laverne, all of them. Angelica, all of them. So I think it's we need um, trans queer actors and actresses. Straight people should not be playing those roles. They can't tell the story like we can. So true. So for me, too long for get to pass. After that, it's like it's really no reason. That was like what '93 when that came out. So it was still kind of. I can deal with that, but it's just on TV. No, that's it. But after that, you know, go and find that talent that lives that life and that walks it every day. Because um, I had a really big issue with a very popular director that, you know. Medea? I'm not, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks. Like, if I was trying to keep a secret, maybe I'll do that.
I used to tell people all the time, because they thought when we got gay marriage, oh my God, we got gay marriage. And my community was like, oh my God, everything's fine, the world is safe again. And I was like, really? Well, what about all the black and brown people who can't afford to get married, who can't, don't have jobs, who don't have homes, who don't have this and that? They didn't care about them people. They, their ceiling was marriage, and once they got it, they stopped working for everybody else. So in Hollywood, right, when we think about what that glass ceiling is for black queer folks, what, where, what, are your, what do you see that ceiling as being? And if you see a difference between the ceiling for, for white queer folks or white folks, period, black queer folks? Um, I feel like it's slowly becoming better. Um, the ceiling for the white folks, of course, is always going to be essentially higher, especially for queer white folks, because I feel like they, essentially, when you think about racism, it goes back into that t conversation, like, mm, uh, the character, I, I learned about this today, blind casting, you know, so we learn about that, uh, outside of actually casting for the specific role, I feel like now, more black queer people are being visible. Um, it's only because of cultural shift. Like, I feel like as a culture, we need to continue to have those conversations. We need to continue to support, like you were talking about, like MJ Rodriguez, all like all these trans actors and actresses, all these LGBTQ people in, in film and even music. Like, the more we continue to buy go see their movies, you know, buy their books. Like, so we have to support them like we're supporting our straight uh, actors, right? And I feel like when we go into our, and this is a whole different conversation, when we talk about cultural uh, and generational aspect, like more people now are giving flowers to our own community, but it's just not enough. You know, we need to be, we need to, we need to sell out, like y'all be on Beyonce tickets for $7,000. Y'all can't go see a, a movie to support a trans woman, a LGBTQ black actress, Latino, for $14, $21? You want to bootleg it, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, but y'all can go see Neil Patrick Harris at a movie and give him $1.4 million for shooting. You know, it's, it's like these conversations need to be had because for me, if you ain't cutting me to check, I'm not working for you, period. You know, so I feel like we just continue, we have to continue to support each other in that narrative. The glass ceiling for us in Hollywood is so incredibly high and it's so incredibly hard to get through. And, you know, I am grateful to my peers that support me just trying to go out there every day and work and present my best work because it has to be about community. You know, we do have to have each other's backs because no one else out there has it for us. People say that they want to see you win, but when you start winning a little too much, then it's like, oh, wait, no, wait, no, too, too many of y'all. It's too many of y'all. And it's like, well, yeah, and we're going to keep coming. You're going to open up the door for me, and I'm going to take the door off and have everybody come through with me. And so that's what it has to be, and I feel like I'm so grateful because the kind of people that I attract in my life, you know, lift me up, Lamo being one of them. You know, we, we met in a prop house, and since then he was just like, I am going to try and put you in all the right places and I'm gonna have you meet all the right people, and it's, we have to have that, because that's how we're gonna move forward as just a community at large, but also within this industry that, you know, again, going back to diversity and inclusion, they're just saying it to say it, but they don't really mean it. Chandra? Um, yeah, I feel that uh, the glass screen is, is very high, but one thing I really pride myself in doing is like making sure but also I'm helping the ones that want to come up, come up. So if they have a question, if they want to talk to me, if they, they want to know how do I get into the business, how do I do this, how do I do that, I don't mind taking a Zoom call and saying, come on, I got 30 minutes. Let me tell you how I did this. Let me show you how I did this. Actually, let me introduce you to this person. Let me introduce you to that person. I met Lamo um, randomly on a Taco Tuesday. <laughs> and here we are, you know? And so... But I, I want to make sure that I'm bringing up the people behind me as well. Because if we want to keep going, if we want to keep seeing ourselves, we got to make sure that the people who want to do this, you know, after us, or, you know, have the example too. So as long as we're, like, teaching too, teaching and showing people, like, you can do it, and don't be afraid to ask me a question. Don't be afraid to, you know, reach 
reach out because I want to see more of us. You know, I that's that's my biggest thing. Like the people that are coming up, let's take them in. Let's make sure that we, we stay together and we show them the ropes because it is important. It's very important. They all said it best. So like I, as you heard, I will help. You know, because that's how I was trained. It's like chicken head every day if you can. So it's like that's something that I've been doing. You know, so if I can help any of anybody, I'm going to. If there's a door and I'm like, okay, well, you can come here at this time, do it. So we have to keep pouring into each other to make it where our counterparts are. You know? Can we give it up for our panelists, audience? Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I really enjoyed speaking with all about the work that you're doing. Super proud of you. Definitely going to follow you on social media to keep up with what you're doing. Um, so yeah, just thank you very much for being here with us today. Give it up one more time for our black, queer, and shaking things up. This amazing panel was presented and sponsored by Gilead. And also, we do have a film that's getting ready to start at 8.50 in the theater. It's called Little Richard, I Am Everything. It starts at 8.50, and this one talks about Little Richard as an icon of rock and roll through a wealth of archival and performance footage. This homage to the originator explodes the whitewashed canon of American pop music and tells the story of the black queer origins of rock and roll. So make sure you guys go over to the theater right after this. Uh, come meet them. And we're going to walk over to the theater, go ahead and watch the film, Little Richard, I Am Everything. Y'all know who Little Richard is, right? Okay. Y'all know, know who Little Richard, all right? So we're going to watch that movie. This is sponsored by Gilead. Make sure you guys follow them on social media. Follow 